Hi, everybody. Welcome to our uh, second show of the year. We're here at Simple. I think you can recognize it now. Um, uh, I survived the first show. It was really good. I, I had a good experience of, of why I'm doing YouTube. And I have a, I have a lot to share with you at this, with uh, our second show. And I started with the two questions. If you remember some of the videos we had done last year and the year before, I started with two questions. Um, so here's my first question, as you can see it on the image. How do you create obvious truths for yourself? And what, what, what do you mean really by an obvious truth? Well, sometimes for me, um, like when I do obvious truths for production, I have to, it's, it's an obvious truth that I've created and come to know is I have to treat a lot of the native plant seeds to go through winter. So it's, it's obviously truthful for me that I have to moist cold treat them for six to 12 weeks to get them to germinate. And I discovered what that time frame would be by having seeds not germinate. So that became an obvious truth. And obvious truths sometimes are obvious and truthful to me, but not obvious and truthful to others. And that's what happens to me in my design. I'll have an obvious truth. This plant should go with that plant and looks good with that plant, and that becomes an obvious truth. But the plants don't agree with me. As they grow together, one is shading the other out more, so it's giving me more to do to prune one plant to keep it from shading out the plant that I obviously thought the two would live together. And if I have that time to prune yearly, they can live together. So I created an obvious truth, and I kept it an obvious truth, by adding something to what I had to do to one or the other plants to allow them to collect light and stay healthy and live together. So that's kind of what I mean by obvious truth. Again, it might be obvious to me, but the obvious truth isn't the same one to other people. And the second question is, do you realize that your outlook about something is only from one point of view? So I may see something and say, wow, I really like that. That's going to be something I want to follow through on. That's what I'm going to do. And here's the reason I like it. That's just my point of view. That has nothing to do with how you live, who you are, or how anything else should get done. So I always like to keep that in front of myself and, and I share that with you. Because I think you have to remember that too. When you're looking at something and you love something and you believe that's the way it should, should be, that's just your point of view. So I think when we need to get and express this more uh, nature-inspired style of planting, we have to remember all the other people that don't have the same point of view that we have. And it doesn't mean we're right or they're right, or we're wrong or they're wrong. It just means having discussions and talking to people and not judging, well, you don't know anything. How can you, how can you not see that's beautiful? But by sharing with them why you believe it's beautiful and healthy and see if they understand your way of looking at something and then see if you can understand their way of looking at it and then through self-discovery in time we'll all we'll all meet together on, on this nature nature inspired plantings and the one good component that will begin to meet clearly is nature itself because nature itself plays one consistent role in who who she is what she does and how she how she operates and once we fall into that system and share that equally we're, we're rolling along okay I'd like to look back uh, on some of the discussion points in earlier shows and you can go back to some of the earlier shows about creating plant patterns but here are some of the questions from previous shows that I always ask, my, I ask myself to understand the plants I'll use and the plant patterns I can develop creating a livable life. I saw that phrase on, uh, I forgot where, but I love that word, a livable life. How I can create a livable, livable life for the plantings that we're designing with. I'm selecting plants based on their relationship, first of all, to the goals and objectives of the project. Each planting is unique unto itself. There's no planting like no person that you'll do or I'll do that will ever be the same, just like there's no person 
that has ever lived on Earth, that will be the same as any other person that has ever lived on Earth. You're the only you that will ever be on this planet for the entire life of the planet. And your design will be the same thing. You look at all the great gardens that have disappeared and will never be back no matter how you follow the plan. So, and that's where I go back to the livable life. The gardens you create, they at least can be created so they have this livable life and shelf life of maybe 10 to 20 to 30 years and what the stewardship costs are to care for them and the love of caring. Are the plants I'm using durable? That's my first thought. Are the plants I'm using durable? Do they know how to live in this region and have durability? Do they respect their space? I, don't, I'm, I, don't, I can't start with thugs and bullies. I can't start with reseeders. Other, other practices love reseeders and they love dynamics happening as quickly as possible. I work my way into dynamics. I want reseeders, but I don't put them in until the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth year. I want dynamics, but I want to start with stability first so I can work dynamics into it. And, and also, do they have a forgiving nature? Do the plants I'm choosing have a forgiving nature to live well in the conditions they are being planted into? So I, can't, I don't have an opportunity to change the conditions the plants are going. I can't bring out uh, big pieces of machinery, dig down three to four feet, and bring in soil mixes. That's not going to happen. I have to look at the site, understand who's living there and how happily are they living. And the, the best indicator are the plants that are living now, whether it's turf or a weed population, Canadian thistle, bindweed. I don't want them to be there. But if that's what's there, I can understand the conditions the plants that we'll be putting in will live based on observing and understanding the plants that are living there now. Am I placing them so they can grow into each other, sharing resources? And that gets back to things I've talked about, a growth rate and growth habit of plants from youth to maturity. If I have a plant, my plants are in three inch pots and I'm putting three inch pots out, how is that plant, all the three inch pots going to relate to each other as they grow into each other to become adults? So gr growth rate and growth habit are always important to me to understand how these plants will grow into each other to share light resources so they can all collect light and live happily into the future. And then within that future, the dynamics will start to occur as I put in, or I don't put in. So I have choices. I can introduce reseeding plants to add some dynamics, or I can, keep, I can keep the stability and integrity of the initial garden. Both of those take gardening skills. One is identifying plants more, and the other is knowing the plants you have and keeping the integrity of those plants within the planting. Am I placing them, uh, am I aware, this is, the, this is the key one for me, am I aware of who the gardeners are? Who will care and nurture the planting and do I understand their capabilities of care? So if, I have to, if I'm designing something and I know I'm handing it off to, no offense to anybody out there, if your company's called Jimmy the Mowing Guy, I'm not picking on you. So if I'm handing the garden off to Jimmy the Mowing Guy, what capabilities does he have to understand how to interpret the plant relationships as they constantly change from year to year and grow into each other? If he doesn't have a lot of experience, then I have to, I have to start the planting at a very limited level of what Jimmy's capable of doing. And then I would talk to Jimmy, I, I would interview him even before I put the planting in and share with him what's going to happen and share with him the opportunities he has, not only for his business, but for himself start understanding plants and working with them and moving them into a healthier situation and adding value by putting uh, additional plants in later. And sometimes Jimmy the mowing guy would be very receptive to that. And other times, you know what, this is all they do. This is how they make a living. They're not going in that direction and they're not interested. So I have those two choices to work with, but I really, and when I, make, when I make a choice, then I sometimes steer myself away from Jimmy the mowing guy that wants no interest at all in gardening because I don't see, I don't see success into the future with the plantings, just the constant weed, wood chip, and replace, kind of the mantra we live in now in uh, our landscape culture. 
In the initial planting, are the dynamics of the plants I've selected modest enough not to reseed or spread opportunistically to inhibit the newly planted plants from reaching maturity? I'd like to read that again. In the initial planting, are the dynamics of the plants I've selected modest? I don't want a lot of competitors to start with. And that's just me sharing with you. Other people do. They want that high competition. They want the dynamics. But I want modest growth of plants that respect their space. Not a lot of receding or spreading by rhizomes or roots. Not to recede or spread opportunistically to inhibit the newly planted plants from reaching maturity. So basically what I'm saying, I'll give you an example. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Solidago rigida. If you grow Solidago rigida, it's a native plant from a kind of dry domestic prairie. Solidago rigida will flower and set seed the first year from seed. So if I put in Solidago rigida into a newly planted garden, that will start distributing seed the first year from seed. And its children will start distributing seed the following year, the first year from seed. And in five to seven years, all I'm going to have in that garden space is solid eagle rigida, about 85 to 90%, because they grew so quickly, they shaded out everything else I planted. So I'm not going to put solid eagle rigida in the first year, but like I mentioned earlier, when the plants are mature and established and, and create a closed community, I will put solid ego rigid in maybe year four, year five, year six through the interpretation of how dense the community is. So I just wait through time to add plants that could be more opportunistic. Okay. So we'll, we'll be, uh, I'm going to design a few grids now. And I have a uh, images of the plants we'll be, we'll, I'll be using. It's going to be, uh, you can see Acalyhella glashoff, Orbexillium pedunculatum, Sprobulus heterolepis, Lobelia syphilitica, Schizacrium scoparium, and Sprobulus aeroides and Parthenium integrifolia. That'll be our plant palette for these grids. And again, you can see the images up there. So, um, Let's see what happens. Okay. So the first one I'm going to design is Orbexillium pedunculatum with uh, Echelia hella glashoff. So I think I'm going to create a one, two, three. And hella glashoff, the beauty of hella glashoff, it has a tremendous tendency to grow upright in, I call average soil, but it's a soil with about four to five percent organic matter. Three, three to five percent organic matter. Hella glashoff has very strong stems. So what I probably I'm going to do is start, I'll put a little triangle as orbexillium and the square will be heliglashoff. So I'm going to start with an orbexillium and I'm going to go about uh, 15 inches away another orbexillium, and I'm going to put another orbexillium in the corner. So that gives me two, which will be fairly tight, creating a larger space, one in the corner. Then I'm going to put hella glass off. Move it over, hella glass off. I'm tightening them up. I'm going to have them on 12 inch centers. Oh, and see the eraser? I always have an eraser. So I'm going to put Hella, because Hella Glashoff, because it's vertical, it can quickly collide into itself and still be able to collect light and both crowns can stay healthy because of its vertical nature. If it flopped on top of itself, like a lot of the Echelium millifoliums do, they're kind of loose, then they would inhibit each other from collecting light and weakening. So I got about 12 inch space here, 12 inches, I'll put that down, space. Then the Orbexillium here, about 15 inches away. Hella glash off. And here I can go 12 to 15 inches, 12 for hella glash off. I'll put another hella glash off here. Orbexillium here. Hella glash off through the center. Hella glash off. 
and another hill of glass off, and maybe one here on the corner, depending what I'm running into. What's this going to go into? Or I could leave this out too. So that's, a, that's an if. But I got a good start. So I've got the orbicillium drifting here, a larger, two together, gives me a larger, almost covering four feet. I've got orbicillium here covering about uh, three feet, two and a half feet wide, two and a half feet wide and a hell of glass off drifting through the middle. The yellow with the uh, lavender blue of the Orbixillium pedunculatum. Okay, and, and this will, by the second year, the hell of glass off will be touching. And for the third year, they will definitely be touching. Again, they have the characteristic of vertical stems, very strong stems. So they're not gonna collapse on each other. Some will be leaning, of course, but most of them will be upright and vertical, even with the weight of the flower. And you can see the orbicillium is gonna be just this loose, gentle look, upright, but more mounding. They both will have a mounding look, but the strength of Heliglashoff will keep this together. And then you'll have the gentleness of the orbicillium pedunculatum, kind of, uh, it's almost a, I'd say like a, like a cloud. It's a very gentle feeling on the corners through here and on each corner. Okay, let's go to the next pattern. We'll make this one, uh, what are we doing? We're doing orbicillium, uh-oh, orbicillium again. That must indicate that I'm trying to get you to, to uh, a lot of you to look up orbicillium pedunculatum. And I have to be honest with you, I have no idea what the common name is. I think it's snake root, but there must be 10 to 15 native plants called snake root. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five feet. We'll make this five by five. What am I using? I should check. Sprabulus, pan oh, I'm using four plants. It's a good thing, see, it's a good thing I checked, four plants. I'm gonna make this five by 10 or eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we'll make it five by eight. Okay, I got a five by eight. We're using orbicillium. We'll put a circle for orbicillium. We're using uh, Sprabulus heterolepis. I'll put a square, circle, square, an X for Parthenium. Sprabulus. And what else I have? Oh, Liatris. Okay, we'll put a uh, triangle for Liatris. So I've got four plants and I've got five by eight, I got 40 square feet. So I'll start again. So I've got five by eight, so I've got 40 square feet. Um, I think I'll start again with the orbicillium in the corner. And then I'm gonna put uh, two again. I'm gonna put a parthenium with the orbicillium. I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna use uh, Sprabulus. A little square, I'm putting two Sprabulus. Three, four, five Sprabulus. Then I'm putting Parthenium here, two. Orbicillium. Another Sprabulus, a Sprabulus in the corner, Orbicillium, Orbicillium here, I'm going heavy on it right here, and a Sprabulus on the edge. And I think I'll put, what do I do here? I think I'll use a Sprabulus here and another Sprabulus. So I've got them about 12 to 15 inches apart, the Sprabulus, but that's okay. They, they, can, they can live closer together. Why is it that they can live closer together? You can put them pot to pot because their foliage lets light through. So they'll always get enough light energy to stay strong. Some of the, some of the crowns might get smaller, but as the other plants get bigger, they're gonna fill in that hole in five to six to eight years. So if, he, if one of the sprouts is smaller, 
because it has less ability to collect light. The other sparabolus, as they mature, will fill in that hole. So you don't have to worry about it. And it might be an opportunity later to put some bulbs in six, seven years later as you're gardening. And plenty of other opportunities will occur in the garden because the garden will be dynamic and changing um, through that time period. So we've got two partheniums. I got them about 12 inches apart, a parthenium in the corner. And now the liatris. The liatris are very vertical. So I just put three or four coming right through everything, especially the sprabulus. So I'll put a liatris here, one here, one over here. And I'm going to put one coming up between the parthenium and the orbicillium. Again, vertical. It, and it'll come through the orbic cell because the foliage will emerge. And again, with narrow foliage going upright, it's going to be able to collect sunlight because the foliage on the latris is leaning, but leaning vertical. And it'll have enough, it'll have a, enough of an ability to collect sunlight with the orbic cilium and the parthenium because that's the nature it's lived in in prairie. It's, it's lived in the conditions of plants, warm season plants growing equally together and the liatris within those conditions always had the ability to collect light because of its growth, equal growth rate with the parthenium, even though the orbicillium will be a little taller, light will still get through to the liatris because that's the conditions it's always lived in under those limiting light conditions as it breaks through and flowers in June and July. It's very cool. When you look at the conditions plants have lived in, who they've lived with, you can start to understand how you can relate them in a, in a tighter way and dense the planting zone. So I've got one, two, three, four, and I'll put another liatris probably right here in, the, in that uh, corner. Okay, so I've got the orbicillium. I've got a gap here probably, a little gap here. So what I might do is put in another sporobolus, I think right here. I want that hole filled. So isn't that cool how I can see the gaps right on my grid paper? It's July, I don't know, end of July. I mean, I'm sorry, it's end of January. <laughs> I got really excited about the weather. Anyway, it's the end of January, and I'm sitting here with the tea, and I already saw a planting mistake I could have made and had too big a gap in that one area, so I could just add another sporobolus to that particular plant. And again, they can live well, tight, and close together. Okay. Okay, well, we finished uh, two patterns. <clears throat> so I think we'll start pattern number three. And well, this, this pattern consists of, we're gonna make it one, two, three, four, five, six feet by one, two, three, four, five, oh, six, six by six, okay. So we've got 36 square feet. And our plants choices for this one is Sporobolus aeroides, it's a beautiful native western grass, native to the Utah and uh, Idaho. But it has really good durability in our clay soils as long as it's not overwatered. So I would look that one up. I think you'll enjoy Sporobolus aeroides, silver tinted foliage. And it flowers in June and reblooms in uh, early September. So we have Sporobolus. Sprobolus, and then we're using uh, Orbicillium. Okay, <laughs> I've got another garden with Orbicillium. I guess what I'm trying to show is all the opportunities with this plant that uh, shows, and everyone we're using has the same potential. I could disassemble the grids I put together and reassemble them and have a totally different pattern. That's the cool part. So we have Orbicillium, and then we're using Schizacrium. Okay, put an X for little blue stem. Zacrium and Achillea, back to Heliglashoff. We'll be using Achillea and I'll put the triangle for Achillea, Heliglashoff, Hella. Again, if you remember before Heliglashoff, vertical stems, that's the key component to this. Um, so let's start off, I'll start off with Sporobolus aeroides here, here. Here, I want to make a nice grouping of it, something large, because it, when it blooms in June, it's like a puffy cloud. I want to get that puffy cloud. And then I'll put in Heliglashoff, triangle. 
Heliglash off. And I want to extend Heliglash off down here. Down here. Remember, I can put them tighter. I can put them on 12 inch centers because of their vertical look and that ability to, sh to collect light because they're upright. So I have a group here. And then I want to put, uh, maybe on this corner, again, I'll put two and right on the edge, about six inches. When I lay it out, it'll be about six inches from the edge, six to eight inches. And then the foliage of Hella Glashoff will touch the edge of the bed. So I need about eight inches for that foliage by the third year to touch the edge of the bed. And then, um, okay, so it's Sprobilis and Schizacrus. So now I just in, put the grasses in. I've got Hella Glashoff. Oh, Orbixillium. Okay, Orbixillium I'm gonna put here here, and that's between the, the Heliglashoff, and I'm going to put one here and going into the corner. And then a the little blue stem, Schizacrium here, 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 and then Sporobolus, Aeroides here, here, and in, betw in between the Heliglashoff and a little blue stem in between. Again, I can put the little blue stem in between Hella Glashoff vertical with vertical with the little blue stem. So again, they're gonna grow upright, about, about the same growth rate. The Hella Glashoff will be ahead of the Schizacrium, but the Schizacrium, and because Hella Glashoff is vertical, the Schizacrium will grow upright and have narrow foliage that's able to collect light because it has so many solar panels it can use to collect light with. And then in this corner, I'm just going to finish it off with Sporobolus. So I have that Sporobolus, uh, large grouping of it here. I have the uh, Hella Glashoff in this corner, in the middle, and in this corner with one little blue stem coming through it. And then the Orbixillium with that soft lavender flower and that gentle look kind of on uh, in the center. I, f I forgot where I located. In the center going this way. And there, so you have Orbixillium, soft and gentle through the center, and the Sprobilis aeroides, mostly on the outer edge and then coming down from the little blue stem. And every plant here, again, because their vertical growth habit and the, and the timing of their growth, will be able to collect sunlight, share resources, and not interfere with each other's way of being from youth to maturity. Okay, that's our third path. Let's take a look at pattern number four. One, two, three, four. We'll go five feet by four feet. One, two, three, four. Oh, we'll go five by five. 25 square feet. And in this pattern, we have Lobelia, Lobelia syphilitica. So I'll make a circle for Lobelia. Uh, Sprobilus heterolepis triangle. So we get Sprobilus heterolepis, Lobelia syphilitic, and I, I'm, I'm beating you up with this plate, aren't I? Or Orbixillium. Orbixillium pedunculatum. And Parthenium. Okay, so again, the plants we're using, five by five, which is a tight area, it's a tight area. Uh, Lobelia syphilitica, Sporobolus heterolepis, Orbixillium pedunculatum, Parthenium integrifolium. Okay, so we've got, again, Lobelia syphilitica has a vertical growth habit. It flowers later. This will be the latest flowering uh, in plant included in the patterns. It has a vertical flower blue in mid to late August. Uh, in our area, in our area. And it grows in damp soil. A lot of times you find it along streams and creeks and floodplains. But because it grows in a floodplain, it has adaptability to dry soil. So it's, a, it's an easy garden plant to grow and also has a tendency to be an aggressive uh, a reseeder. So that's the one component I always have to be aware of when I put a plant in, the, or, the more aggressive reseeder. So 
I'm using lobelia, and then I have to be aware of who I hand it off to because you'll have to watch for all these little seedlings that come up. Usually you see them easily the second and third year. And we just hoe them out. We take the Dutch push pull hoe and hoe them out, or maybe leave a few, depending where they're coming up. And that's part of the uh, interpretation of the relationships taking place within the garden. And that's the fun part. To me, there's no more fun in, in oh, there is more, but it's interpreting relationships that when you're hoeing, I can't find more fun than moving that hoe through the garden in May and interpreting relationships that are taking place. So the possibility I might have to prune something, or maybe in two years I have to thin something or take something out or, the year, or a year later. But my mind keeps looking at all the, all the interactions that need to take place. And a lot of times there's no interactions. You look at it, this is stable, this is working out for the moment. And then when you come back in a hole later in the year, you might see some changes. And that's called gardening. That's what gardening is. G gardening to me is the joy of relating to other living things other than humans and understanding how they live, how they grow, and not just creating beauty, but creating opportunities. And I'm learning more about insects, birds, butterflies, and how they build homes and use plants for, for the construction of, of their own homes that they live and have children in. So it's very exciting. Um, okay, so lobelia, I don't want to put lobelia on the edge. So I'm going to start again with Sprobilus heterolepis along the edge on 12 inch centers, tight, and one up the middle. I'm going to take the Orbixillium and put that here on the edge. And I'm just going to use one, and I'm going to put lobelia. Oops, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Get the big eraser out. I was using the circle Sprobilus as a triangle. Okay, there's Sprobilus heterolepis, Orbixillium, Parthenium, Sprobilus, and Sprobilus here. So I have the Parthenium, the Orbix Orbixillium, and then I'm going to put Lobelia here, one Lobelia here. Sprobilus between it, Lobelia, Orbixillium here, and another Sprobilus. And then I want to do a Parthenium, I'll put two here. I have Lobelia, so I want another Orbixillium here to go with the Parthenium, Sprobilus, and Sprobilus. Okay, so I've got Lobelia here and here going vertical between the Sprobilus. I've got a group of um, Orbixillium. I got one here and one here and two Parthenium. So I got the moundy, the bounding lavender with the upright flat flowers of the Parthenium. And I've got Sprobilus on the edge. Now what's good about Sprobilus on the edge is when I bring a new pattern in, you can see here, I can use the grass as grout. The grass is used to connect pattern. For me, I use grasses to connect patterns together. So if I have another pattern here, say I take this one up here, but I wouldn't because that's probably steroides. I, I, it's hard for me to match those up with such few numbers. So I take one of the first patterns I did, bring it up here, I would put another sprobilus here, another one here, and then I would start my new patterns here. So you can see, See how the Sprobilus becomes grout, tying the patterns together? You get a nice, soft, textural look, and you can put bulbs through it. I could even put a couple liatris through there if I wanted. And that could be something I do in the future. It could be something I do now. Or I, I can wait. And maybe it needs to be budgeted in for another year financially. But these are all the things you can deal with and all the situations that you can create and all the solutions you can have based on, on financial moments or also who's taking care of the planting and their awareness of this diversity in style. Or you start with the simplicity in style that's able to be interpreted by the people caring for it and then create more diversity as the garden ages and the people caring for it understand that diversity as it's being added to the planting. And again, I go back to that, that's called gardening. I'm gonna do one more pattern and then um, let's see, I'm going to use, 
I think I'm going to use, well, I, we've used everything. I think I'm going to use uh, liatris. Let's, let's make, we'll make it four by four. We'll do a smaller one. One, two, three, four. Four, one, two, three, four. We'll do four by four. I'm just going to do a simple one with Sprobulus aeroides. That's the one I mentioned, the Western native, has very soft texture, blue-green foliage. You'll like the foliage. Blooms in mid-June with a cloud, a very open panicle, and then reblooms through its browning panicle in early September. So I got Sprobulus aeroides, and the X will be Liatris. So I'm just going to use two, two plants together, and, and to be to, to mention it too, you could just do a four by four group of Sprobulus aeroides and use that intermix within the planting to give you a, a little larger group. Sometimes uh, people might have their opinion where well, you mi mingle too many things together. And I have to say, sometimes I do, I get carried away. But as long as my team of gardeners can take care of it, we're okay. And that's what I mentioned in earlier shows, you have to be very aware of who you're handing the garden off to who's going to be the parents. Um, so with Sprobulus and Liatris, I'm simply putting aeroides, 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 everywhere. The whole thing is aeroides on 12 inch centers. Okay, put one here. And then I'm gonna take Liatris, not on the edge. I don't want Liatris on the edge because then you'll see the, fol you'll see the foliage as it's turning brown before it flowers. I want that foliage hidden by the Sprobulus. So I'll put Liatris here, 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 and maybe one there. So I'll use one, two, three, four, five in there. Six Liatris, and the rest is Sprobulus aeroid. So I've kept a very minimalist look with the Sprobulus and its gentle texture. And then the minimalist pattern, that can be mingled in in so many different ways with the more intimate uh, patterns that you create. Or you could take this and just stretch it out 25 feet long and make a nice simple look along the edge. And again, I'll, uh, when I first met Pete, Pete Outoff in 2001 when he came to Northwood, he said one thing that changed my life in design. He looked at the, the uh, salvia East Friesland and Cecilary Autumnalis I had planted at Northwood. And he said, Roy, you're too choppy. I said, what? That's a beautiful pattern, but your, plant, your patterns are choppy. It's this, that, this, that, this, that. Stretch them out. Take your patterns and stretch them out. And I was, li I was living like a double life because when I did native gardens, I, was, I did a large prairie garden in 1996. I did stretch them. I just used Sporobolus and little blue stem because with those two grasses, if I keep the planting low, it's more, much more acceptable by all the other people out there that don't understand what that mixed planting was. So in Sporobolus, I mixed in Echinacea pallidas and Allium cernuums and uh, Rebecca's and Retinibas. But Sporobolus was that stretched out matrix. But I never thought of doing that with perennial gardens. I just tried to show off everything. And when you show off everything, it's too eclectic. It, it, it actually is hard to look at. So Pete, when he said that one thing, Roy, stretch it out. I keep that in mind for all my designs that I, I create. So uh, that ends this show. Hey, thanks a lot for being here. If you have questions, those are excellent. And uh, let's keep thinking, right?